Well, good afternoon. Um, this afternoon, I'm going to give you a brief overview of recent technological developments in the courts of England and Wales. And I apologise, but this is a subject I could bore for England on, and I would normally speak for over an hour on it. Uh, today, I'm going to try and take a whistle-stop through what we're doing in about seven or eight minutes. So, um, I'm going to describe two main developments in our civil jurisdiction, and, and then I'm going to talk about the role which e-service currently plays, and then I'm going to wrap up with a few general observations. So, firstly, technology in our courts. Our two jurisdictions, England and Wales, are currently partway through a £1 billion reform programme, which is aiming to bring new technology and modern ways of working to the way in which justice uh, is administered. Historically, the use of technology in our court systems has developed in a piecemeal fashion and uses a wide variety of platforms, most of which don't talk to each other, and are now, in the 21st century, beginning to show uh, their age. So the reform programme uh, is wide and complex. It comprises over 50 projects across all jurisdictions, civil, criminal, family and tribunals. Many of these projects involve designing what we call common components. And one of the central components to all this is something we call core case data. It's effectively a database which contains all relevant case information. And each jurisdiction will have its own interface uh, with that core case data database. Examples of the sorts of components that are being developed are systems to upload and manage documents, systems which will enable fully video hearings to take place. And as far as the civil jurisdiction is concerned, the major developments are the development of what we call the online money claims system and the rollout of an e-filing system for the higher courts i.e. the High Court, the Court of Appeal, and the Upper Tribunal. We're also upgrading all our court facilities. Uh, Wi-Fi has now been upgraded and, and rolled out in every court centre uh, in the country, and updated and more modern uh, facilities for video conferencing uh, have been put in place. So the online money claims system, or sometimes called the online court, this is a digital service for people to resolve civil money claims in a simple and accessible, proportionate way. Users are able to create an account which enables them to issue and respond to online civil money claims. And the value we've set on this is claims worth less than £10,000. And the system is designed to be used without lawyers. People may receive legal advice, but the system is designed for use without lawyers. New procedural rules have been written, and these rules are embedded into the system. So users are guided through uh, what they have to do uh, by a series and sequence of screens. And by the end of November 2019, I think we'd had almost 103,000 cases uh, through the system. And music to the Ministry of Justice they would taken almost £6.3 million worth of court fees. One thing we noticed was that the average time to progress a case through to a first directions hearing using this system had shrunk down to 5.2 weeks from 13.7 weeks. So between now and the summer of 2020, the system will be expanded to increase the type of claims that can be issued and further stages in the system are being built so that we can enable more online negotiation and settlement, the uploading of evidence, and facilities for judges to decide cases on the digital papers or digitally in face-to-face -face hearings. And we'll also put in place a structure for enforcing judgments. This system has been designed and built by the Ministry of Justice using what we call agile methodology. And for those not familiar with the method, it means building small components quickly, putting them to test in the real world, 
iterating and improving them in response to feedback so that we can be ensured that the systems will really work in the real world for people that have to use them. And we have judges actively involved at every stage of the development. And in the long term, a similar system using core case data will be extended to all civil cases in our jurisdictions. The second project is what we call e-filing. We call it CE-file. This is a stopgap solution. It was developed by the Ministry of Justice in partnership with Thomson Reuters, the legal publishers, and it is for use in the higher courts only. It was introduced into our business and property courts in London in 2015, and in the first quarter of, of this year, it was extended into the rest of the High Court, and we are actively engaged at the moment uh, in taking this system uh, to the higher courts and the property and business courts outside London. So we've had more than 750 new users, professional users, registered to use the surface, and there are already approximately 10,000 cases uh, being actively managed on the digital platform. Use of this system is mandatory for all represented parties. It is not mandatory for people who do not have a lawyer and who are not represented. But in this system, those people have their documents scanned onto the system by uh, reference to court staff. We've also had to write new procedural rules to permit the use of electronic documents, deal with electronic court seals, uh, and to cater for how time limits work in a court system that's open 24 hours a day. This is all covered um, under our civil procedure rules by a temporary practice direction. The e-filing system will be used to case manage requests made to the central authority under the Hague Convention and the Evidence and Service Conventions. Um, but it will not be used at the moment for transmissions of requests incoming or outgoing to a requesting authority or party. However, the systems we have in place will make this technological possible, technologically possible. Uh, it depends on the interoperability, as I think Florian called it, or, 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 or the pipes <laughs> that were referred to. So the infrastructure's there, it's just a question of how we plumb it in. Lastly, e-service. E-service has been possible in England and Wales since 2009 in fairly limited circumstances, and the circumstances are set out in our Civil Procedure Rule 6. That is, the party to be served or his lawyer must have indicated to the serving party that the party to be served is willing to be served electronically. Now, from what I've heard, that might be thought to be unnecessarily restrictive, especially given the advances in technology and the almost universal acceptance and use by legal professionals of email. And I think there is a good case to be made for extending e-service to all those who are professionally represented. Of course, it's always been possible for the court to, in a last resort, make a, an order for substituted service or alternative service. And examples of methods are familiar to you all. Fax, email, social media. Service has been achieved through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It's not, therefore, envisaged that electronic service will become a primary method of service in the new, near future for originating process. But once originating process has uh, been served, then all documents will be sent or served to the parties by uploading onto the electronic case management systems. And so there will be no need in the future for physical service of the documents once proceedings have started. So some final observations. Market research tells us that the users of these new systems appear to welcome them. There is a high degree of user satisfaction. The benefits we found are clear. There's 24 hours access to the legal system, and there's a huge reduction in the time that progress, in the time taken to progress cases. We've also had to put in place a system of digital assistance to help people who lack access to technology or who do not possess the necessary skills. However, our experience to date is that uh, very few people have had to call upon the need for these services. 
That may well be because these systems are automatically drawing to them the technologically adept, uh, but it's something we'll keep an eye on in the future. So finally, um, there seems to be a positive thirst from personal and professional users of our court systems for technological innovation. And so one might say there is a favorable climate uh, for future development. So thank you. <clears throat>
you will be notified by text message and email that you have a document to check on the website. Through the home page, you can also view all the documents of the case and evidence of the case like this with an e-record viewer. Now, when is e-service deemed made? It is deemed made when the person to be served actually checks the e-document on the home page. But what, I hear you ask yourselves, what if someone does not check it on, on purpose for a long time? To, in order to prevent this situation from arising, we also have a provision that, in the act, that e-service is de deemed made when one week has passed since the day of notification. In other words, you have one week to check the document, and afterwards it is regarded to have been served, even though you might not have actually checked it. We also provide mobile app service for e-litigation like this. Finally, what about cross-border cases? If a defendant leaves abroad, we should first serve them a printout with information concerning e-litigation system. If the defendant agrees, then e-service could be from then on. In regards to HCCH service convention, Judicial documents can be received in electronic, in electro electronic form using our e-litigation system, but first, the requesting authority of other states should register as a member of this website, and it needs verification. So for the verification, it is not a difficult issue in terms of technology. It is easily solved, but uh, it needs cooperation among states in advance. Thank you very much for your attention. Now, Judge Adamic will give us the Brazilian experience and point of view. Thank you. I will uh, give you my, uh, my thanks for HCCH for the invitation. And uh, as I heard in this morning, uh, security issues are most important we are uh, feeling here. Uh, but I say security matters can't stop the use of technology because technology grows so fast that tomorrow we have new issues and new issues. So we must try to go to technology to improve uh, the system. I want to, to talk at first about the National Council of Justice on Brazil. It was created by a constitutional amendment in 2004 and installed in 2005. It's the central body of the internal control of the judiciary in the administrative and financial sphere. Chaired by the president of the Supreme Court, it has 15 members from various branches of the judiciary, as well as the public ministry, lawyers, and seats nominated by the National Congress. The CNJ also acts in strategic definition of the judiciary's performance and has several policies in this regard. So in this regard. Supervision of the activity and conduct of judges, encouragement of mediation and conciliation, law enforcement action program that addresses the reduction of domestic violence, supervision and support to the management of the prison system, national system of adapt, adoption and child care, and implementation of, implementation of the electronic judicial process. Due to Brazil's large territorial extension, the judiciary needs a large number of judges and a considerable structure to provide a quality public service close to the population. In 2018, the Brazilian judiciary had over 78 million cases uh, in, 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 in the courts. These processes are divided into five different branches, state, federal, labor, military, and electoral branches. There are 18,141 judges, in which 15,618 in the first degree of jurisdiction, 2,449 in the second grade, we call up, up, up courts of appeal, and 74 in the superior courts. Appeal courts run the first degree of the structure of jurisdiction. 
the Superior Court and Supreme Court administered the structure. In 2018, we had 28 million new cases received, 80% of which were electronically uh, filed by web. Uh, we had uh, developed a lot of systems and programs for our uh, judicial process. One of the first of them I want to talk is about electronic judicial process. The CNJ, with the contribution of several courts, develops and distributes at no cost a computer system for management of case at e-file, exemplifying the use of paper and physical presence of the actors in the courts for the practice of the control are all procedure, or for our procedure act. Currently, 76 courts, courts of appeal and superior courts, have implemented the CNJ system, called PGA, in replacement of their own case management system. The goal is to meet all the competence of Brazilian courts with the same technological solution. The PGA system is moving towards a microservice driving transformation with the adoption of a platform concept that includes a cloud-based attitude. Besides, CNJ has created an, an artificial intelligence center and has a platform for training and hosting AE models. One of the pillars of the PGA programs is a collaborative work with the courts. The electronic judicial process in CNJ, most extensive program for the Brazilian judiciary, with 31 million cases filed. We also have a national adoption and child care, child care system for children and adolescents. The online platform named National Adoption and Reception, Reception System has as its foundation the integral protection of child and adolescents. The system seeks to record and crawl through all relevant facts from the entry of children and adolescents into child care service until the effective exit from the system, whether by adoption or family reintegration. Adoption is just one of the aspects managed by the new system. Controls through alerts allow the fast to, for faster case referral and resolution. The software aims to provide a more effective attendance of children, helping them to stay at least as possible in child care programs. All legal refers derived such as reintegration to parents, care talkers, adoptions, concentrated hearings are complaints. The system keeps a complete history of the child adolescence with audibility of all action executed. Currently, we have 37,896 registered children, 1,054 children eligible for adoption and 34,477 qualified applicants. We also have developed a program for monitoring the prison system. The CNJ has a department to monitor and oversee the prison system and the socio-educational measures enforcement system. In terms of technology, the software is being implemented for the computerized control of criminal execution and information related to the Brazilian prison system through the national territory. The system provides a more efficient procedure process and reliable data management regarding the Brazilian prison population. As benefits, we can see centralized visualization of key case information, automatic penalty calculation with automatic scheduling of benefits described in the penal execution law. Electronic monitoring of progression, progression deadlines, providing in real time the status on going criminal executions, statistical reports, and access through any computer or mobile device connected to the internet. In, currently, we have 960,000 uh, active processes. 82,35% of the country courts will use the system in place. We have we are using, uh, at the same time, an uh, online litigation platform to large litigants. Is using the technological architecture of the electronic judicial process, a specific model was developed, aiming to help solving conflicts in the area of consumer protection. 
Uh, also, we have a, a artificial intelligence branch. CNJ has established an artificial intelligence center for research, developed and production of artificial intelligence models to be used in the PGA platform. The center develops and maintains a software called Synapses with the following objectives. Build an AE service ecosystem, platform to train, host and distribute artificial intelligence models, and cloud operating that acts as a hub for Kurtz. In addition, truly the next year, the system will start a process of consolidation of the, all the judicial process database spread over the country, aiming to obtain structured information for the construction of AE models. The use of AE in the judiciary has two main objectives, automate work routines and provide decision support tools. As well, we have a national interoperability model, we can NMI, uh, that it's a, a national consul, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a joint venture with the National Council of Justice and the National Council of the Public Persecution. Uh, developed, um, developed what was developed in 2030 as a model for integration and electronic transfer of data and procedural documents between the various participating entities of the activity of judice. The national interoperability model represents the standard for the exchange of the procedural information within the judiciary. The implementation of the model is under the responsibility of the courts and private institutions interested in acting, adhering to the model. This standard implementation through the web service technology ensures the integrity, inviolability and security of legal proceedings, including procedural secrecy, when applicable. Data exchange is independent of existing implementation in each public and private agents or institution. So, that are the most important programs we are developing. In, in, and I think the MNI solution we have is the solution to integrate the system of different countries to make a better uh, e-service for all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I'd like to just start by picking up on, on the last point that you made there about interoperability and the ability of your system to receive and possibly transmit uh, to other jurisdictions. That, that, that's something that you seem to be thinking about at the very start of this process. Um, how, how, how do you see that working in the future? Uh, we are working on this since 2013. So we had this interoperability with a lot of systems. You can uh, extract data and send data to different systems if you use this mo national model. And we have maybe 20 or 30 different systems. They are uh, so they're speaking all with internally each, speaking yeah, to each yeah, other. Speaking to each other. And so, what about speaking to the wider world? Uh, 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 are you think, beginning to think about that? Is there thought being given to how you might connect with other legal systems? Uh, I think the, the, <coughs> the technological solution is the same. Yeah. So we can use the same uh, model to make, speak with other countries too, because that's only technology, not uh, yeah. really a legal problem. Huh? And is that the same in Korea? Does the system that you're using to manage cases and, and conduct your internal uh, legal affairs, I, I, do you think that system is also capable of being connected or receiving information or uh, processed yes, from outside? Um, yes, <coughs> technically it doesn't have any uh, difficulties, but we, when we are, when you want to use our lit e litigation system to a service abroad or requesting ser uh, the receiving service request, um, the first thing we need to do is for a verification of process. Yeah. So yeah, we need to verify the requesting authority's identity. So yeah, it needs. Yeah, in this, technically, it, 
it doesn't have any difficulty, but it needs cooperation and interoperability. Yes, and it is. That's another um, important mm. point, I think. Um, verification yes. of, of either an individual or a corporate entity mm -hmm. or maybe a, a, a another judicial system. Mm. Uh, and uh, I'm interested to understand how our three jurisdictions deal with the question of um, verification of individuals and other institutions. H how is that done in Korea? Um, uh, actually, we have public key authentication system. It is very unique in South Korea, which means it verifies your identity. So this is one of the main challenges we are facing now with respect to residents living abroad, because um, public key authentication is necessary when you submit e-documents in the e-litigation system, because it has to verify you are you, is, you, are you and so. Uh, but it is very more difficult for foreign, foreigners, for other nationals than Korean citizens, to obtain. So it is easy to obtain public health authentication when we are Korean citizens, but it is not uh, technically a difficult issue to be solved, but uh, it needs more uh, consideration. Do you, do you have a central register of citizens? Right, right, right. Yeah. Do you? Yeah, yes, you do. we are. So uh, there, there, but there's the answer. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can yes, verify. yes. Now, is that the same in Brazil? Yeah, no, we are working <coughs> in, a, in a national uh, identification database based in fingerprints collect and, uh, and all facial recognition. So then we can exchange the verification with the identification service to attest. We do that actually with the bar, because in Brazil, the litigation, except in the small claim courts, is mandatory you have a lawyer. So that's, uh, if you have a lawyer, I can authenticate if he, this person is really a lawyer. Then it's, it's no, the, the problem with the identification of the, the claimer is not so uh, big, because you know who is his lawyer. Okay, and then he is responsible for this too. So it's the lawyer who effectively provides <laughs> the guarantee of identity. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, these are concepts that are rather strange to me because, uh, as you may know, in the United Kingdom, we have no central register of uh, individuals' addresses or email addresses for that matter. And that's one of the reasons why personal service remains uh, at the forefront of our service options. Um, would it were different. <laughs> um, now, the other uh, issue that I was quite interested to hear was that each of these, our three jurisdictions, have chosen to address these technological issues in a slightly different order and in a slightly different way. As I said, in the United Kingdom, we've started by looking at small claims as an access to justice point, Career, it seems, has gone on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction model, but done the full court service yes. for each jurisdiction as you've gone along. Uh, and it looks like Brazil is advancing <laughs> on all fronts to, to cope with what I can only call a, a massive caseload. Yeah, to, nowadays we are, uh, all new, new cases are electronic filed. I mean, mm. Uh, we had 20% of the ancient case, old case, they are in paper, and, but the new cases are totally electronic. Filed. And that, that, that's a mandatory requirement now, is yeah. it, in Brazil? Yeah. And, and what about Korea? Is, is use of the system is mandatory? Not mandatory, not mandatory. It is up to the party's consent. Yeah. And uh, because the consent is required still now because there are still many people who are not familiar to IT service for many reasons, such as disability, old age. So we need to ensure due process to these vulnerable people as well. So we think that for the time being, uh, traditional means of e service should be remained along with e-service until this issue is fully resolved. So, yeah, that's why we require consent um, in terms of e-service. Well, yes. I think we're reaching the 
time limit for our session oh. now, but uh, we'll throw open the uh, platform to the floor and see if there are any questions from audience members. There's a gentleman here, back row with his hand up, if someone's got the blue box. <laughs> Hi. Firstly, thank you very much for all of you for coming here and sharing your insight with us. Um, but my question is, where do these electronic systems of e-litigation e stand on the possibility of appeal? And is, is there a real person involved in an appeal procedure or are there any legal issues that arise from that? Yeah, thank you. Well, um, it's a subject I would like to have got onto but haven't. Um, I, I think that as far as we are concerned, our general case management and mitigation systems proceed in the usual way. Uh, there are appeals to the next court up uh, and they're done in a traditional way. I understand in Brazil they're beginning to look at artificial intelligence uh, as a way of filtering and is that right Judge Adam? Yeah, but it's not uh, the artificial intelligence is not the judge, no. so <laughs> it's only a tool. Uh, who will decide the case is a judge, yeah. a human judge. <laughs> but I think you described to me earlier that you, you were using AI models to help you filter uh, yeah. the, the cases that come to judges. Yeah, to, to <coughs> the assessment to the, the court, to the higher court, and also to, to give you a uh, precedent look, look uh, if, uh, to, to, to see what in the past was similar of this case, so you can have a better, make a better decision. But the, the final decision is made by a human being, not, not by a machine. Yeah. And I think that's the same. Yes, we are also preparing <coughs> some, some devices of uh, AI for assistance of judges, um, not making final decision, but assisting judges with searching similar cases or filtering and yes. yeah, we are in the process of development yes. now. And for appeal, the system has uh, 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 access to uh, all, all the superior courts. The same process is growing court to court and your appeal can, can be electronic handled. So once yes, our system, same, for same example, oh. is extended, you will file an electronic notice of appeal mm -hmm. and it will be managed electronically and eventually it will be put before a judge who may decide it electronically uh, or with electronic aid. So you'll have an electronic file, there may be an electronic hearing, but it's re a judge who will remain in control yeah. for the foreseeable future. Uh, no, no one is thinking of uh, sitting a robot in the, <laughs> the judicial chair. <clears throat> yes. Next door. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, so I had a question if whether any of your jurisdictions have been considering to delegate some of these tasks of operation and innovation of these judicial programs to private uh, entities and companies. Well, I think I mentioned that uh, our case management system in the higher courts has been developed with a private company. Um, we took the view that we would have to wait too long to develop the system from small claims right the way to the top. We wanted something as a stopgap. And we saw that uh, Thomson Reuters in particular operated in a number of other jurisdictions. They operate in many states of the United States. I think Singapore uh, and a number of other jurisdictions. And they had a tried and tested core product, uh, which meant that we could utilize that with confidence. We knew it would work and we knew it could be adapted. Um, but the service agreements provide, as always, that it's the uh, judiciary who are in control. They're, they're providing a service, and there are service level agreements which deal with the interaction uh, between the state, the judiciary, and the service provider. In Brazil, some courts are using private systems, but uh, the national policy is we developed our own system uh, and we can buy a, a, a service from private enterprises, but the system is a public system and will be managed and uh, developed by the CNJ. So we, we, we want to avoid to use private systems at the future. 
Yeah, in South Korea, it, um, the e-litigation is a cent centralized and managed by the one institution, the Supreme Court IT Center. So it is, I don't think it will be privatized or, yeah, because it is already centralized and managed by the Supreme Court IT Center. So. Gentleman at the front here. Oop. I lost it. <laughs> so, um, one, one thing about the experience in the United States is that, in principle, our court files have always been open to the public, even in uh, divorce cases, even in child custody cases and so forth. But in practice, when everything was on paper, there was not really a serious privacy concern because it was very expensive and difficult for news gatherers or others to go to courthouses all around the country and gather cases. But now that in our federal system, for example, all cases for many years now have been filed online, and in many state judiciaries, cases are now filed online, it has become possible to scrape those databases. And even though the information has always, in principle, been public, now it really is public, and it creates new kinds of privacy issues. So I'm wondering, in each of your jurisdictions, how you manage the, um, the problem of making more accessible information that is sort of deeply personal? Well, I think that's a very, very interesting point. Um, my answer from our jurisdiction is that we fall back upon our general law. Um, unlike the United States, there hasn't been an unrestricted right of access to a court file. There is a right of access to a court file, but that access is controlled by the judiciary. Uh, and an app certain core documents will be available um, in circumstances where it is necessary to protect the vulnerable or under other criteria, it is possible to anonymize cases uh, where the parties' names may be removed and replaced with letters or where certain documents uh, may be uh, withheld from inspection altogether. But that's a process that certainly in our jurisdiction is subject to judicial control. And again, I suppose, like most of the things we've been talking about today, the technological world raises problems that we've probably already addressed and overcome in the paper world. Uh, and it really is just a question of, of thinking how we go about that. I think your example is maybe one of those unforeseen consequences of the speed at which technology has developed. Uh, uh, and maybe if you'd seen that coming, <laughs> you, you, you might have had more controls in place or thought about how, how, how these um, registries are, are, are available. But on the other hand, open justice is a, a, a big topic uh, uh, and public availability and visibility uh, of what is going on is, is important. I don't know whether you have any doubt. Yes, uh, in the past, um, the public documents like uh, judgment, judgment, judicial decisions uh, could, could not be go public, but nowadays we are changing our legislation and we, are, we have all the ju judicial decisions uh, go public mm -hmm. and without name and with name removed. So, yeah, and we are changing our policy now. Yeah, in Brazil we are similar uh, to England. Uh, family cases, childhood cases, they are not public. So, uh, I think it's a good way to make uh, transparent, but not uh, give your privacy to handle with all the world. Huh?